this is from the previous set of lecture notes on the classical ciphers, but generally talked about attacks. And we skipped over one slide, and I forgot to come back to it, so now's the time, because we mentioned some of the concepts as we move forward. Coming back to an attacker, what they want to do is discover the plain text or the key. Okay. Getting the key is better, because then you can, uh, if the other users don't know, then you can easily decrypt subsequent ciphertext that you come across. The attacker, we assume, knows ciphertext, so we can obtain the ciphertext, and we know the algorithm being used, so that's an assumption. Uh, hiding the algorithm is usually not possible, uh, adds very little extra security. We'll see, and we'll see today in some at attack where the attacker often makes use of known pairs of plain text ciphertext, and that's what we'll see in some extra attacks, some different attacks. We've mentioned brute force again before, so you know about brute force, try all keys. So you need to know how many keys and how, how many keys we can try per second to work out how long a brute force attack takes. Cryptanalysis, we've seen some attacks, for example in the quiz, the monoalphabetic cipher, we can use frequency analysis. That is, take advantage of the fact that the plain text and the cipher text exhibit similar characteristics in the frequency of letters, diagrams and so on. And there are other types of attacks that can be performed on real ciphers. Often, so now moving away from brute force, often the other types of attacks, there are some common techniques which are applied across against different ciphers. So there may be attacks specific to one cipher, like DES, but, but it won't work on AES but then there may be some general techniques that may work across a set of ciphers. And we're not going to go into any details of those techniques. We may see, today we'll see one example, we may see a few later, but uh, just to mention some of the methods, the general methods. Linear cryptanalysis is really trying to find some, think of some linear equation that relates the ciphertext back to the key and back to the, the plain text and solve effectively that equation. But it's, it, it can be very complex. And differential cryptanalysis is looking at differences in, uh, across different plain, uh, ciphertext values to try and work out how that maps back to a key. We'll see meet in the middle attack today. That'll become clearer. Side channel attacks, and there are others. Side channel is using uh, some outside information to try and use determine the key or the, the plain text. An example, and it's, it's used in a number of systems, is when I encrypt something on my computer, say I'm implementing, I've implemented DES and I'm encrypt, encrypting some data, there are many different operations of DES. We saw simplified DES yesterday, the rounds, the XOR, the uh, permutations and so on. It turns out, in some cases, if you can measure how long it takes your hardware to do each operation, you can get some extra information and try and then use that to try and determine the key or plain text. So one example of a side channel attack is actually measuring how long the, the hardware takes for each operation in the encryption. And because depending on different keys and different plain texts, the operations may take different amounts of time, so by analyzing that, you can start to work backwards from the ciphertext to a key or plain text. So using extra information, some other information from some other channel. Often, attacks are compared against the worst case brute force. So the, if we can do brute force, then fine, we can defeat the cipher, but often the, the success of other attacks is compared against, well, how long does it, does it take compared to brute force? We'd like to be faster than brute force. Okay, so brute force is the, the worst case approach. If we can come up with an attack which is better, faster than brute force, then that's a good thing from an attacker's perspective, defeating the security. So with brute force, we normally measure the number of operations. So how many decrypts do we need to do to defeat the cipher, to find the key, for example? 
which depends entirely on the, the number of keys and the time, or, and the time depends upon how long each operation takes. So, a cipher with a 64-bit key takes, worst case with brute force, two to the power of 64 operations to find the key. So we use a similar metric to measure other attacks. How many operations does it take to find the key? It should be better than brute force if that attack is ever any use. So if a brute force attack takes 2 to the 64 operations and we've got some other attack that takes 2 to the power of 60 operations, then we'd say that's better than brute force and is the weakness in the cipher. But the other thing we'll see the other attacks use is not just that they take many operations, but to work, often they require some memory to store information while they're performing the attack. The less memory required, the better it is from the attacker's perspective. And often they require knowledge, the attacker requires knowledge of past pairs of plain text ciphertext. So the attacker has some ciphertext, they're trying to find the key often attacks assume that the attacker also knows some other ciphertext values which were produced with the same key from same, some plaintext and the attacker knows both the pair of plaintext and ciphertext but they don't know the key so how many pairs of plaintext ciphertext and, uh, or and particular, um, can we choose particular values has an impact on how we measure how successful an attack is. Some classification of that information known by the attacker, not this slide, is here. What is known? From the attacker's perspective, okay, let's imagine we're the attacker trying to defeat a cipher. The worst case for us, well, first, in general, the more information I know, the, more, the better it is for me to be able to attack a cipher. So the worst case for the attacker is knowing very little. The worst case is knowing just the ciphertext and the algorithm. We assume in all these cases we know the algorithm and if we just know the ciphertext, then we need to take that ciphertext and the algorithm and determine the key or the plaintext for that ciphertext. Normally we look for the key. But it can be a little bit easier for the attacker if they know some pairs. In addition to the algorithm and ciphertext, they know some pairs of past plain text ciphertext. Somehow, they've discovered some past ciphertext values and the corresponding plain text, but not the key. So that's what we mean by plain text ciphertext, ciphertext pairs. Plain text was encrypted with a key to get a ciphertext. The attacker knows the plain text and ciphertext, but they don't know the key. They're trying to find that. That information can help the attacker to try and find the key. How do we get a past pair of plain text ciphertext? Uh, maybe the plain text became not important and is no longer considered secure and is made available, so the attacker can. Uh, learn the plain text without knowing the key. Uh, the, the simple example, I think I may, may have mentioned it before, is that okay, um, some ciphertext is some information about some event happening in the future. The event will happen at this time, at this location. After the event happens, the attacker knows the ciphertext they also can determine the plain text because they know that the event happened at this time and at this position so they can determine what the original plain text was without knowing the key. So there are a number of cases when the attacker, we assume, knows pairs of plain text ciphertext. If the attacker can choose what pairs it can learn, it can make the attacker even or the attack even easier. So a known plain text is the case where the attacker is able to find some plain text ciphertext pairs. 
chosen plain text is where they've chosen particular plain text values and found the corresponding ciphertext values. An example, I choose a, a plain text value as the attacker and somehow I get the user to encrypt that plain text with their key and I intercept their ciphertext. So now I know the plain text and ciphertext. Choosing the plain text allows the attacker to choose values that may help breaking the cipher by finding weaknesses that depend upon that plain text. So being able to choose the specific value can help in some attacks. Chosen ciphertext is similar except the attacker gets to choose the ciphertext and can find the corresponding plain text. Chosen text is when we can have both. The attacker can choose both plain text and ciphertext and get the other value in the pair. Generally, as we go down, the more information the attacker knows, the greater the chance they can perform a successful attack. With ciphertext only, then it's harder for the attacker. With chosen text, is generally easier for the attacker. We'd like to design ciphers such that we can defend against any attack, preferably. Even if the attacker knows chosen plain text, chosen cipher text, or even chosen text. Sometimes we can, can def defend against all, sometimes just selection. So the more info that the more information the attacker knows, generally the easier it is for them to attack. We'll see this come up when we perform an attack in a moment. Well, soon. Hopefully at the end of this lecture. And the last thing that we missed over how do we measure security? Well, the absolute measure, we can say a cipher is unconditionally secure means it's perfect in terms of security. That is, the cipher text has no information such that an attacker can find out the correct plain text or key. So a cipher which is unconditionally secure has that property. The only known the only known cipher that is unconditionally secure is the one-time pad. We've seen the example of the one-time pad. Even if we try a brute force attack, given some cipher text, we cannot determine the correct plain text or key. So it's perfect in terms of security. It's unconditionally secure. Under no conditions is it insecure. No other ciphers are known to be unconditionally secure. There are conditions in which they are insecure. So therefore, to be practical to compare ciphers, we talk more about computational security. And in general, a cipher is considered to be computationally secure if the cost of breaking it exceeds the cost of the information encrypted, or the time required to break exceeds the useful lifetime of that in encrypted information. Example, I have 100,000 baht in my bank account and my password to get access to my bank account is encrypted. And someone finds the encrypted password, some malicious user, a student, and they want to get my 100,000 baht. So they go and they buy many computers and do a brute force attack against my password and they spend a million baht to find the password. They get the password. They get into my bank account. They steal my 100,000 baht. This information, we'd say, is computationally secure because the value of the information was 100,000 baht for the attacker, but the cost of breaking it was 1 million. So it costs them more to break it than it is to, than they get in return. So a simple example that we need to evaluate how much is the information worth? That one was easy, but uh, I encrypt I encrypt a 
confidential information about trade secrets for my company. I don't want other companies to get that. What's that information worth? It's very hard to put a value on lots of information. So it's hard to put numbers on how much is the information actually worth and how much would it take to, cost, uh, to break that? How much cost would it take? It's hard to estimate the value of a lot of information. The other one is the exam. I have the exam on my laptop for the midterm. The midterm is in what? Four weeks time. And I encrypt the exam. You can have the cipher text. You again, you have all these computers, the lab computers, and you start your attack. And it takes you seven weeks to find the exam answers. But the exam's over. Okay, you had the, you sat the exam. You needed the exam answers in four weeks. It took you seven weeks to get them. So again, in that case, we'd say it's computationally secure because the time required to break the cipher exceeded the the value or the useful lifetime of the the encrypted exam in that case. Again, it's hard to put or it's hard to estimate what the lifetime of some information is. So although the concept is easy, in practice knowing how valuable information is, how long do we need to keep it secure is not easy to predict. And how how long does it take to break is again not easy to predict. So one time pad is the only, only unconditionally secure cipher. All others are conditionally secure. That, so therefore we look at the computational security. How much effort, how much cost or time does it re require to break it? And we'll come to some of that when we look at DES. So let's go back to our DES slides, our block cipher. And there's two concepts we skipped there on DES as well. DES and the FISL structure and many block ciphers in general use the concepts of diffusion and confusion. And one of your favorite uh, scientists come up with these concepts, Claude Shannon. Some of you took ITS 323. We saw Shannon capacity equation about how much information we can send across a channel. Shannon came up with that. Uh, Shannon also did a lot of work on security or the concepts of security. Security and data communications are closely aligned. It's about representing information and getting a information in a, an efficient way from A to B. So there's similar concepts. So Shannon come up or define the concepts of with ciphers we'd like to have a cipher that has diffusion and confusion. What do they mean in simple terms? And just go back, the Feistel structure and including DES use or apply these concepts. So they do have this. Diffusion is spreading out the plain text when we get the ciphertext. Our plain text always has some structure. Think of an English phrase or document. There's some structure in the frequency of letters. When we apply our cipher, we'd like that structure to be diffused to be spread out across the entire ciphertext. So the structure is no longer present in the ciphertext. That's the idea there. So that the structure in the plain text or the statistical nature of the plain text is reduced in the ciphertext. So preferably that it looks random in the end. How to achieve that? Apply permutations or transpositions repeatedly and then on the input uh, plain text and apply some function to uh, like a substitution function in the same way that DES has some basic permutations P, we saw those P boxes we saw in simplified DES P10, P8, P4 permutations but also some S boxes for substitutions and repeat each round. So that increases the amount of diffusion of the plain text. 
the other part is confusion. Make the relationship between the ciphertext and the key complex with the intention that even if there is some structure in the ciphertext, so the attacker can find some structure in the ciphertext, that is some letters occur more frequent than others, it still should be hard to take that ciphertext and find the key. So if, if that's achieved, we've got confusion. So making it hard, given the ciphertext, to find the key. So make the relationship between them very complex. We saw in some of our classical ciphers, once we find the ciphertext, the, the key is easy to find. Once we found the ciphertext on our monoalphabetic cipher, we've automatically got the key. Whereas with DES and other ciphers, we'll see even if you find the ciphertext for a given plain text, it's still hard to find the key. And that's the concept of confusion. And it uses some substitution, some complex substitution algorithm. Nonlinear means it's hard to go in the inverse. And in DES, the S boxes implement this. They in increase confusion in the cipher. Let's hope it decreases confusion of your knowledge of DES. Let's go through and look at the design characteristics and summarize what we know about DES. We went through an example of simplified DES and then a comparison with real DES. And it's really scaling up. Simplified DES, we make it simple so we can do an example. Real DES just is more S boxes, more rounds, larger blocks, and so on. But the same concepts and operations. You can look through the details of DES. Again, of course, no need to remember these, and no need to remember simplified DES operations. Okay, so I don't ask you in the exam uh, to remember these S boxes or this this picture or these permutations. You don't need to remember them. The reason we went through this example was for you to see that we're using very simple operations, permutations, substitutions, but combining them together to get uh, a good cipher. So let's go and look at some design characteristics of DES. Is it good? And one of the, the measures of seeing how good a cipher is, and it's not just for DES but for others as well, is the avalanche effect. An avalanche, what happens? At the top of the mountain, a small thing starts falling, a small rock falls, and it knocks more rocks, and more rocks, and more rocks, and at the end there's uh, the whole mountain falling down. Okay. The concept is that with ciphers, we'd like to have the avalanche effect. With good ciphers, and the effect is that small changes in the input produce large changes in the output. A small change at the start means a large change at the, at the end. And we can look at it from two perspectives, from the input being the plain text or the input being the key. To show that, we'll look at uh, two examples here. First, in summary, DES has the avalanche effect. That is, that's good for security. It's considered designed to be uh, a good design because it exhibits the avalanche effect. And the next two slides give examples of that. The idea is that we have two different plain text values. They differ by just one bit. If you look, these are in hexadecimal, but in fact it's just the first hexadecimal digit differs, 0 to 1. In binary, just one bit differs in these two input values. So a small change in inputs, what we'd like is to produce a large change in the output ciphertext. And this shows, shows those changes. So we see after a set of rounds. So we start with plain text, this 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, so on. That's plain text 1. 
and the one below it, 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, is plain text 2, and of course they differ by just one bit, single bit difference. And the delta column shows the number of bits that differ. So at the start, just one bit differs. And then we encrypt through the different stages of DES, real DES, not simplified DES. And what this table shows is the output after each round. DES has 16 rounds. So we take the input plain text, we apply round 1, and the output, if we encrypt plain text 1, is this 3CF, da da da. And the output, if we encrypt plain text 2 after round 1, is this 3CF03, and so on. There's only one bit that differs between those two outputs. So a small change in the input so far has only produced a small change in the output. That's not the avalanche effect. But with deaths, we go through multiple rounds. If we do the second round, we get this output, or these two outputs. They differ by five bits. After three rounds, a differ of, difference of 18 bits, four rounds, 34, and we keep going after our 16 rounds and our inverse initial permutation. In this specific example, 32 bits differ. And that's what we aim for. What we'd like is for two input plain text values which differ by just one bit, when we encrypt both of them using the same key, we'd like the ciphertext values to be completely different. Now, remember with DES we use 64-bit blocks. So the output ciphertext 1 and ciphertext 2 are 64 bits in length. What we would like is that the differences are random or appear random. And on average, if you have a 64-bit block, we'd like at least half of the bits to be different. 32 would be optimal. It turns out to be 32 in this case, but not in all cases. Because, as an example, let's say an 8-bit block. Let's say a ciphertext is... What's a ciphertext value which is different from C2, uh, C1? Significantly different. We have an 8-bit ciphertext value, to keep it small. What's a value that is significantly different from C1 in this case? So, an example ciphertext, C1. Give me an example ciphertext. Right, let's keep it simple. What's the difference? How many bits? Just one bit differs in this case. So, I would say that these are similar. They're not much different. So. Eight bits differ, right? That's significantly different. But now if we have a random or another ciphertext value, then we'd like on average, if we consider all possible ciphertext values, on average we'd expect half of the bits to change. Because what if we have all the bits change? And it's just the inverse all the time. Another random value, maybe 8 bits. How many bits differ? 1, 2, 3, 4, just two random values. 4 bits differ. On average, if we take two random ciphertexts, we'd like half of the bits to differ. So with DES, which has 64 bits in the block, an avalanche effect ideally would produce half of the bits different after encryption. In this specific instance, we do 32 bits. In other instances, it may vary. It's not always the same. So that demonstrates that the avalanche effect is in effect in this example, and it is in general with deaths. And it, 
in fact turns out after about round four we have this difference of around 32 it goes up and down a bit so maybe we can just encrypt uh, after four or five rounds and stop with this so the number of rounds generally the more rounds you add the more secure the output is but the more time it takes to implement so it takes time to do this processing so 16 was chosen as a trade-off of okay we see that four may be okay in this case but maybe in other cases we need five or six rounds well 16 is uh, gives us some more freedom some in case uh, there's some cases which don't have the avalanche effect until six seven eight rounds but it's not too many such that it's too slow to implement so choosing the number of rounds was an important design decision I've asked in exams or in assignments to measure the avalanche effect of different ciphers you may see some examples later so understand what it means the second one is the same concept but take two plain text values which are the same these two values encrypt one with key one encrypt the same plain text with a different key differing just by one bit so going back the second example is plain text are the same but the two keys that we use to encrypt differ by one bit in the first example the plain text values differed by one bit the key was the same and we see in this case where we change the key again after six seven eight rounds we're getting close to this about half bits are differing in the output after the entire encryption 30 in this specific case on average if we try different values we'd like 32 to be the average difference so DES has the avalanche effect which is good and in fact it uh, is achieved after just several rounds which means it's likely that the number of rounds of 16 is sufficient it was a good design choice what else about DES? the key size is not good the 64-bit initial key in DES is actually split into two parts eight bits used for a parity check but not used in the encryption so only 56 bits are used in the encryption so an attacker really only needs to, only needs to guess those 56 bits which means there are two to the power of 56 possible keys or about 7 by 10 to the 16 in 1977 someone designed a machine they didn't build it they designed or estimated a machine that would break deaths in about 10 hours if it cost 20 million US dollars so that's what 40 years ago in 1998 the Electronic Frontiers Foundation built a machine that cost a quarter of a million US dollars and they broke it in three days so a brute force dedicated hardware to try desk keys they did it in about three days today it's considered too short to withstand brute force attacks 56 bits is not long enough in general with DES the algorithm is considered secure the limitation is the key size so the design people have done a lot of analysis and they find in most cases it's secure they can't find weaknesses in the algorithm but it has the weakness of the key length is too short so one approach then because many people had software and hardware that implemented DES being used a lot they trust the algorithm how do we make it more secure use it multiple times with a different key each time take a your plain text encrypt with DES with a 56-bit key you get some ciphertext then encrypt that ciphertext using DES again with a different 56-bit key and you get your ciphertext and now effectively you have 2 by 56 bit keys or 112 bits and a brute force against 112 bits is uh, considered reasonably secure nowadays 
So the concept was reuse deaths by applying it multiple times. And a popular cipher today, and uh, although no longer recommended but still widely used, is triple deaths. And that ignore this 128-bit keys, we'll look in details and see there are different options for the key length for triple deaths. So, yes, it uses 128 bits, but there are other values. We'll see that here. What else about death? There are some theoretical attacks on death. Timing attacks. Observe how long it takes your hardware to encrypt and decrypt and use that information to try and work out what the original plain text or key was. In theory possible, in practice very easy to, de to defend against by changing the implementation of DES to have some small var variations in how long each operation takes. And that makes these attacks, these timing attacks, almost impossible. There are other attacks by observing how plain text values change over time, looking at the differences, there are some attacks. So remember brute force in DES, 2 to the power of 56 operations. That's the worst case. This differential cryptanalysis attack, they could get it down to 2 to the power of 47 operations. Much better. But it required the attacker to have 2 to the power of 47 plain text values known in advance. So they need to know a lot of plain text in advance for this attack to work. So in practice, not very useful. And another one, uh, linear cryptanalysis, got it about the same number of operations and they need 2 to the power of 43 known plain text values. So if the attacker knows a lot of past plain text ciphertext pairs, a lot in this case, 2 to the power of 43 pairs, then, which is what, 100 billion different pairs of ciphertext plain text, then they can do attacks on deaths which take about 2 to the 47 operations, about uh, 1,000 times faster than a brute force attack. Still slow. Well, today, nowadays, brute force is easy against deaths. So, because it can be broken in brute force, these attacks, people do not explore them much more because you just use brute force to break it. Another issue with deaths was that originally was designed in private. The people who designed it were for companies or governments, and they didn't tell people how they chose all the values. These are the S boxes from real deaths. They tell us that we take some bits in and we get some bits out. Why is it chosen this way? Or the designers chose it to be this way. And there was no original motivation of, well, why did they choose these values? Why not some other arrangements? It turns out that people have done analysis and found that even though they don't know the original motivations, if you make small changes in the design, it turns out that DES is much less secure. So small changes in those S boxes, for example, means that uh, the avalanche effect is not, not as good and that there's more weaknesses in DES, which suggests that they chose the design to be strong. They knew about other attacks. So generally, DES is considered a good algorithm, but poor key length. And definitely not, not suitable today. What about other ciphers? Triple DES, AES, and other block ciphers. Uh, so the next move, since DES was considered good, to apply it multiple times. We'll come back to this. We'll look at double deaths and triple deaths. We'll come back to these and look at an attack in some detail. But it turned out that even triple deaths was considered secure. It was three times as slow as deaths. 
because in fact you apply the same algorithm three times. So to encrypt something was three times slower than DES, which wasn't fast uh, in the start. So the advanced encryption standard was developed, designed in the, the late 90s. The idea was to make it secure, of course, but also to work well on different types of hardware and in software. The advanced encryption standard is used and highly recommended for use today. So it's still considered secure and it's recommended by the US government, for example, and many people use it in many different implementations in, in uh, wireless LAN, in internet communications, in file level encryption. So if you encrypt your hard disk with Windows or your operating system, it usually uses AES. So it's very common. It uses 128-bit blocks. Okay, DES was 64 bits, AES 128 bits. It allowed different size keys, 128, 192, 256. Okay, so the longer the key, the, the more secure against brute, brute force. It used rounds, and the, depending upon the key length, it used different rounds, 10 to 14 different rounds and used XOR and some other S boxes and some other arithmetic uh, that was a little bit more complicated than DES but still considered secure. We're not going to cover the details of AES. We just used DES to show an example of one cipher. The other ciphers we will not go into that detail. We'll just mention characteristics. Uh, but AES is considered a, a good cipher to use today generally considered secure. And others. A list of some, not all, block ciphers. Uh, some of the designers, when they were designed, and some characteristics, so the block size, the key size, uh, the design approach. The Feistel structure is similar to what the DES used, those rounds with substitutions, permutations. They all use similar approaches, not the same. Some are more secure than others. Generally, AES is considered uh, highly recommended. Let's go back to DES, double DES and triple DES. So given DES is considered secure but the key length is too short, the idea to improve it was to apply it multiple times. Then you can reuse the software and hardware that already implements DES. So, and all the, the experience of using it can be reused. So encrypt multiple times. Each time you encrypt, use a different key. Then for a brute force attack, the attacker needs to guess all keys you use and effectively increases the key length. Turns out double DES is not so good and therefore triple DES was designed. So let's look at why double DES is no good. That is, and also the general concept of double encryption. It's not just double DES. This is the idea. We have some plain text. Normally, we encrypt using some key and we get output ciphertext. So a brute force requires guessing that key. With double encryption, we take our plain text, encrypt with one key, get some intermediate value, X, then encrypt that intermediate value with the same cipher but using a different key. And then our ciphertext is the output. So our key is actually made up of two parts, K1 and K2. And they are, they are different, say two random keys. So now what an attacker needs to do, effectively our key length has doubled. For a brute force attack, they need to guess uh, both values. They need to try all values. And therefore, if K1 is 56 bits, like in DES, and K2 is a different 56 bits, then the attacker for a brute force attack needs to try 112 bits 
That is 2 to the power of 112 operations. So that was the idea of double encryption, but it turns out it has a, a severe weakness. And we'll use an example to go through that weakness to show how that weakness arrives. And the example, you have one in your handouts, but I created a bigger one, which is a little bit more interesting. So take one of these and pass along. It's a cipher, but a, uh, a block cipher we'll use as an example. You don't need to do other courses. You can do other courses at other times. Try and solve this. A few more. Enough. Okay. Just give this to you. I will show it on the screen and explain what it is. We'll use it as an example. A few more if need. First, what, what is this? This is our, let's say, our, our cipher that we've designed. It's a five-bit block cipher. That is, the block of plain text is five bits. We take five bits of plain text. We'll apply our cipher. We'll get five bits of cipher text as the output. So a five-bit block in this case, to keep it small. And we've got a three-bit key. Okay. So the way we read this table is that with a five-bit input block, there are 32 possible plain text inputs, two to the power of five. And I've listed them here on the left column. And then what I've done is said that, OK, if we're using this particular key in the next columns, the keys up the top, 0, 0, 0, for example, if we take the ciphertext five zeros using key 0, 0, 0, the output ciphertext will be 0, 0, 0, 1. If I used a different key, for example, 1, 1, 1 here in the last column, encrypt the same plain text, the output ciphertext will be 11101. That's the right way to read this, this table. Plain text, input, different keys along the top, and the corresponding ciphertext that we'll get out of our cipher when we use that key. I've just randomly created this. Okay, this arrangement in each of these columns, I just randomly mix them up. If you, you check, you'll see that this, this column with a key 0, 0, 0, the 32 values here is just a random arrangement of the 32 possible plain text values. So we have a reversible mapping. We don't map one plain text to more than one ciphertext value. There's 32 unique values here. And I've just a different random arrangement in the second and the subsequent. So it's our simple cipher that we can encrypt any plain text five bits long and we'll get a cipher text as output given one of the three bit keys. Consider this is our, uh, our, our, our cipher. Uh, and we want to increase the key length. So we have our cipher, like a desk but we want to apply it two times to increase the key length, our double cipher, double encryption. So what we do is we encrypt twice, but using different keys each time. So the concept is, let's call our cipher ABC. In the normal approach, what we do is we take some plain text in, our cipher, ABC takes a key as in and produces ciphertext as output. And the, the ciphertext it produces is given by that table. Let's say we want to do it differently and use double encryption. We take our five bit, and the plain text is five bits. The ciphertext is five bits and the key was three bits. Let's say we take our plain text in, apply ABC once, 
with key one and then we'll get an intermediate output we call it X and then apply the same cipher again on that X value with a different key K2 then we'll get our cipher text so that's our double encryption let's see how that works and see how we can attack that just to make sure people are awake uh, with double encryption no we'll see how you're awake when we go through our example um, so we're going to do an attack on this cipher first brute force attack on the single instance of the cipher what would a brute, how many operations does a brute force attack take in the worst case? Brute force on the single instance well we need to try all possible keys we have a three bit key so there are eight possible keys so a brute force takes two to the power of three or eight operations What about a brute force on our double cipher? How many operations? Calculate the number of operations. To the power of nine. No. How many keys do you get to choose from? How many possible keys are? Think of the key in the double cipher as just being a combination of those two, a, a concatenation of those two. That is, to encrypt, what I do is I choose K1, one of eight, and then I choose K2, one of eight. So how many possible values do we have? That is, I can choose a three-bit value here. and a 3-bit value here. We could say our resulting key is let's say K1 combined with K2. So how many keys do we have? How many possible keys? Sixty-four. Where does that come from? Okay. There is there are eight values for the first key. There are eight possible values for the second key. So let's say we choose the first value for the first key. Then we can choose one of eight values for the second. If we choose the second for here, we can choose one of eight. We get eight times eight, or two to the power of six we have effectively six bits okay? three bits here three bits here the resulting key is the combinate or the uh, concatenation of those two so effectively we have six bits we've doubled the key length with six bits our brute force would take two to the power of six or sixty four operations of course easy to break but we'll see uh, much stronger in theory than our sim single cipher doubling the, the key length any problems so far on this concept so we double our key length by applying the cipher twice with respect to a brute force attack So if I give you a plain text, oh, sorry, if I give you a cipher text, you, if I give you a cipher text output, it's five bits, you can try all 64 keys, and one of them will give you the correct plain text. Which one is going to be hard to tell? 
But in general, when we have a large uh, a plain text and structure in the plain text, we'll be able to find it. Now, it turns out, although a brute force attack takes 64 operations, 2 to the power of 6, there's a, what's called a meet in the middle attack, which will take much less effort. In fact, a meet in the middle attack will show we can break this cipher in about the same number of operations as a single version. So let's try it. So we're going to apply the double cipher. The meet in the middle attack assumes the attacker knows some plain text ciphertext pairs. So that's the first assumption of this attack, and I'll give you some and we'll make use of them. So the attacker now, in the meet in the middle, Let's try an attack, and the attacker for this attack to be successful needs to know some pairs of plain text ciphertext, and I'll give you some. I'll give you two to get started. So how to interpret this is, this is some plain text value, this is a cipher text value. Let's call it P1, C1. And this is another plain text value, P2 and C2. Let's assume the attacker knows these values. Somehow they've discovered these values. and. They don't know the key that map the plain text to the cipher text. But they know these pairs. Their aim is to find the key. Okay, so the aim of the attacker, find the key, given our cipher, and given these pairs. A brute force attack, we could take our cipher text and try all 64 keys, one of them would give us this plain text and we'd know that key gives us the correct uh, plain text and that's the key to use. But we can be faster than a trying all 64. Let's see how. So the first step for the meet in the middle attack is that we take one of the known plain text ciphertext pairs and starting with the plain text, encrypt it using all possible key values. So we'll start with P1, and encrypt P1, so a brute force against P1, but for a single version of the cipher. So using different key values, how many possible key values are there for a single version of the cipher? that is, let's go to our picture, what we're going to do as the attacker is we've got a value of P. We're going to encrypt that using our table with a, all possible values of K1. How many values? Well there are three bits so there are eight possible values of K1. And that's the, the eight columns here. K1 of 000 through to K1 of 111 encrypt that plain text and we'll get eight values of this intermediate value x. Do that. See what you get.
So you take that plain text and encrypt it with our cipher, our single version of the cipher, and get eight values of this intermediate output. I'll call it x, uh, say x, x1 with key 1, x11. One one. So when we take p1, 01101, and use key 000, what do we get as an output? Well, you look up the table. Our plain text, 01101, is here. What you do is you take the plain text value, encrypt it with the first key, all zeros, and this will be the value of the x that comes out, our intermediate value. And then do it again for the second key, and you'll get this value out. And the third key through to the eighth key. So we get these eight intermediate values. That's the first stage of this attack. What we're, gonna, what we're trying to do is to find the key in less than two to the two to the power of six operations, in less than 64 operations. The first case is encrypt, uh, encrypt the plain text with eight keys, so eight operations. And you get these eight values as output. Eight x values, so I'll list them. You can check. Uh, I've got the answers in front of me, but just from that table, that row gives us the eight possible values. If we encrypt using the second key, the third key gives us one O. Fourth key Those eight values are just the row in that, that table. You can check. So the row where the plain text is 01101 for the eight different keys. So we just encrypt using our single cipher that with all keys. How many operations so far? Well, eight operations, one for each key. Next step is to take, so we knew P1, and we know the corresponding ciphertext, C1. What we just did is take P1, encrypt it with all possible keys. The next step is to take the corresponding ciphertext and decrypt it with all possible eight keys. And we should get matching X values. Why? Look at our diagram. Our cipher is if we encrypt P with all values of K1, we'll get these eight X values. We know the corresponding ciphertext with P, so if we decrypt C, going backwards, C going backwards, with all possible values of the key, then we'll get eight possible X values. At least one of them, those X values, should match. Because if we use the correct key, if we're using the correct key, we take P1, encrypt with the correct key 1, we get an X. If we have the ciphertext and decrypt with the correct key, we must get the same X. So from the attacker's point of view, try C1, decrypted with all 8 keys, K2s, to get a set of 8 X1s. Encrypt the plain text with all keys, decrypt the ciphertext with all keys with the aim of meeting in the middle. So we know C1. C1 
C1 is our all ones. If we use the correct key, if we encrypt P1 with the correct K1 and decrypt C1 with the correct K2, we should get the same X value. So let's try. So given C1, what is the plain text if we decrypt using key 000? Well, we can see from the table if the ciphertext is all ones, where are we? The ciphertext is all ones here. If we decrypt using key 000, the plain text will be 10001. So we're going backwards now, decrypting. This table shows taking the plain text with the keys, we'll get this ciphertext. So to decrypt, we find the ciphertext, the corresponding key column gives us the plain text. So decrypting this with key 000 gives us 1001. So that's our first X value. And then we do it for the next key. Uh, so same ciphertext will give us this plain text 00110. And then for subsequent keys. If I can find all ones, we have it somewhere down here. And so on. Okay, so we take the ciphertext, decrypt with all eight keys. And the values that we'll get, I have them. Are those eight values. So if you look up the ciphertext with each of those eight keys, the corresponding plain text values will be these eight. And what we said is that if we use the correct key, the X values, if we come from both directions, should match. Which X values match? None of them? Yes, some of them do. Don't necessarily look in this way. That is, if I encrypt P P1 with this key, I get this value. If I decrypt the ciphertext with any of these eight keys, these are the eight X values I get, does this X match one of these eight? And we check. Which ones match? And how many? Try and find them. you'll see that the first X value is not in the list. 11101 is not in this list. The second one, 00111, do we have occurrence? Yes, we do. There's a match here. And then we do it for the rest. And uh, this one matches in two instances. Does it? I thought it was in two instances. Yep. You'll see though the, the three sets of values that match. That is here, uh, what have I, yeah. 00111, 0011, 01000, 01000, 01000. What does that tell us? It tells us the possible keys are either 
K1, so K1 tells us this value, K2 this value. So K1 being 0, 0, 1, and K2 being 1, 0, 0. Or K1 is 0, 1, 1, produces this X value, and K2 being 1, 1, 1, or K1, K2. So it tells us that we've got three potential keys in this case. Let's list them. K1, the first match is that's this value here, and the corresponding K2 that gives us the correct ciphertext would be 100. Zero, zero. Remember, our, our final key is just the combination of K1 and K2. That's a potential correct key, but there are two others as well. And K1... 1, 0, 0, K2, or 1s. So the attacker has now broken it down to being three possible correct values. How do we know which one's the real one? We use our second pair of plain text ciphertext that we know. So we assumed at the start that the attacker already knew two pairs of plain text ciphertext. Sometimes they need just one, it turns out. Sometimes, in many cases, there will be just one correct value and that's it, you've found the key. If not, you need a second pair. And what we do now is check. If we take P2, encrypt with K1 of 0, 0, 1, we'll get some intermediate value, then take that intermediate value and encrypt with K2, do we get C2? If so, this is the key. If not, try this one or this one. Which one is it? So what you do now is take your P2 and encrypt with K1, find the intermediate value, then encrypt again with K2, and the ciphertext you get, if this is the correct key pair, or set of keys, is C2. Let's look in the table. P2 is 11001. P2 is 11001. And the first possible key was 010. Is that right? 001. So we try 001. Encrypt P2 with 001, the intermediate value is five zeros. And then take that intermediate value and encrypt it with K2. So all zeros encrypt it with K2. And what was K2? 100. we get this value as an output, 11011. Is it correct? Yes, it is. So what do we just do? We took, if I could fit it in here, we took our plain text, 11001, encrypted with this key, and the output was our intermediate value of all zeros. And then we took that value, encrypted with the second key, and the output was 11011. And in fact, that matches our expected ciphertext C2. We've found our key already. We were lucky in this case. We didn't have to try the second two. But you can try the second two, and you'll see that 
they don't produce the correct ciphertext. Just to confirm, you'll see that if you take P2 with these two keys, you will not get C2. And the same with the second one. So we have the answer. The attacker knows the key. It's 001100. How many operations did we take to do that? How many encrypts or decrypts? We treat encrypts and decrypts the same in terms of the amount of effort. So how many? Well, we can count them. We took our plain text and tried all eight keys. Two to the power of three or eight operations there. So in the first instance, we took here two to the power of three operations. And then we did the same with our ciphertext, try all keys. So another two to the power of three operations. And then we did one, two operations here, just to check. So two in this case. So the total number of operations, two to the power of three plus two to the power of three plus another two. Compare that to brute force. Our brute force is 2 to the power of 6. In this attack, we had plus another 2. Eighteen operations. Or 2 to the power of 3 plus 1 plus those extra 2. 2 to the power of 3 plus 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 to the power of 3, which is 2 to the power of 3 plus 1, plus another 2 small ones at the end. Sometimes we don't need to do those 2 at the end. Uh, it will vary. Brute force, 2 to the power of 6 operations. Meet in the middle attack, 2 to the power of 4 plus a couple of others. extend that from not a 3-bit cipher to a 56-bit cipher of DES. Our example, we use a 3-bit key. Same concept applies in DES. If you use a 56-bit key, brute force in DES would take, and running out of space, but in DES, brute force would take 2 to the power of 112 with a 56-bit key. But the meet in the middle attack, we see with a 3-bit key, it's 2 to the power of 3 plus 1 plus a few others. It turns out that this is usually quite small compared to this. So it turns out with and 2 to the power of 2 times 3 for brute force. With DES, brute force 2 to the power of 12. With a meet in the middle on DES is 2 to the power of 56 plus 1 plus some others. And usually that's quite small it's, uh, uh, compared to 2 to the power of 56. So approximately 2 times normal deaths. A meet in the middle attack on double deaths takes about twice as much effort as a brute force on single deaths. Double deaths is about two times stronger than single deaths, which is nothing. So if single death takes two days to break, double death takes four days, which is nothing in terms of security. It's not secure. Or if it costs a thousand dollars to break death, it costs two thousand dollars to break double death. So using double death doesn't provide much advantage over single deaths because of the meat in the middle attack. Hence, double death is not used, and in general, double encryption. Okay, this is a problem with double encryption. Turns out by using three stages, not two, we can overcome this meet in the middle attack. And that's where we get to triple deaths, and that's what's used in practice today. So, we're out of time, so 
try and get your heads around how to do a meet in the middle attack on double encryption. But in summary, we need some known plaintext ciphertext pairs. That's an assumption. The attacker knows these values at the start. Just two normally. Even with real deaths, you don't need to know many. You take a plaintext, encrypt with all possible keys, two to the power of k, if our single, single cipher is k bit key length, and then take that corresponding ciphertext and decrypt with all possible keys, another two to the power of k. And then if you find the matching ones, and if you have more than one, then try the second pair. And usually there's not many that are, that are matching. So it doesn't take many further operations to do those second, second pair. And then you find the key. So double encryption doesn't help. Triple encryption avoids this problem. Let's stop there. Next week, we'll move on to the next topic of using modes of operation. How do we encrypt a large document? These are operating on 64 bits, 128 bits. What happens if we have one megabyte? And then move on to, I think, public key encryption. Maybe next week we'll get on to that. If you want to collect your hard copies of your quiz, you may do so. They're in alphabetical order, so you may find your name. <laughs>